Good afternoon. This is Mark Richardson with Vibrant Technology, and uh, welcome you all to a, another ODS Videos webinar. Uh, again, we're uh, today I'm joined by Dan Ambre from Full Spectrum Diagnostics, and today we are going to be doing a case study on a piping system uh, inside an oil refinery, um, and we'll be getting here, getting started here in just a bit. A couple of housekeeping items. Uh, before we get started, if you do have questions during the webinar, you can go ahead and type those questions in the questions box. Uh, and at the tail end of the webinar, we'll go ahead and get as many questions answered as we can. Um, in addition, we are recording this webinar, so uh, you will be getting a link uh, emailed out to you with the uh, full recording of the webinar, so you can go back and review anything that you may have missed. Um, in addition, those of you that registered with um, your addresses, uh, we did have um, the vibration fault guide uh, was part of the registration. So if you did uh, include your address in the registration, we'll go ahead and be getting those out in the mail to you uh, sometime later uh, this week uh, or early part of next week. We should be getting our, all those out. We had quite a few people registering uh, for this particular webinar. So uh, bear with us as we get those all out in the mail to you. Uh, with that, let me hand things over to Dan, and we will go ahead and get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, some refinery piping, which some of you might think is probably not that interesting, but uh, there's a lot that goes into just setting up the shot like we talked about in the last webinar, but also there's, there's a lot of safety and uh, logistic things going on. This piping, uh, the picture you see there, they had to uh, pull the insulation off for me so I could get a good measurement on there. And uh, the piping's 900 degrees. So there really is no other way to do this type of analysis besides uh, ODS videos. Um, MBScope ODS video is a high speed video vibration analysis. The video clip is processed with something they call an optical flow al algorithm. Uh, enhances the subtle displacements and rescales the amplitudes of all the pixels that are captured by the camera. Uh, the process allows users to see what the human eye can't perceive in a video animation, either because the event's too fast, the displacements are too tiny, or uh, the combination of those two. Today we're going to talk about um, uh, a project that I've been working on uh, where we're trying to extract the largest deflections available uh, through the video camera and apply that to a finite element model. So the plant that I'm working with, they have a model that they set up, but there's no correlation. They don't have any measurements to determine if their natural frequencies that are calculated are correct or their displacements or what have you, or even you know the amplitude of their displacements. So this was a case to get in there and measure them directly uh, with the video camera and uh, give them input for their analysis. Uh, what spurred this analysis was a, uh, a crack in one of the piping lines. And uh, this is uh, part of that investigation. So let's see here, there we go. Uh, the title of this slide, Striving for a Repeatable Process. I can't say that often enough because you get tied up in the job and you have to have a process in your head and repeat that for every uh, every point, every uh, data collection that you, you capture. Um, the test subject is a refinery coker drum piping. Now, a coker drum is a uh, part of a distillation process where they crack the, uh, the oil carbon atoms and they extract out different things from them, methane, propane, all the light gases, they float to the top and are sucked off at of the distillery chamber. What's left is things that come closer and closer to pure carbon and that they accumulate in the bottom of the vessel. Uh, the vessel's like uh, 10 stories tall, by the way. Um, and they have to cut the, uh, the coke out of there a couple times a day. I think it's a couple times a day, but anyway. Uh, this puts a lot of uh, impacting and uh, potentially heavy loads into the piping. Um, and that's what we're here to, to discuss. Uh, what we're looking for, 
for the customer is a maximum XY displacements in the piping at multiple locations. So they can feed this information into their natural frequency analysis or their finite element model and predict uh, which modes are being excited and which aren't. So from this analysis, we can extract the displacements, we can extract natural frequencies in the piping, and potentially we can curve fit those with the software and get the damping in each one of the modes, which is pretty valuable when you're uh, working in a finite element model. So um, that last little note here, the ODS video captures a time waveform set for each pixel in the video frame, so we can uh, do an ODS FRF, basically, uh, since we have inputs and outputs in the same file where all the time, all the points are time waveforms, and we can curve fit the data in the MESCOPE software and get all the information that we need, what's the modal participation and amplification and so forth. Um, this is the piping layout, and what's a little complicated, uh, there's a lot of different processes going on. It says eDrum at the top. This uh, there's a big drum and uh, these piping lines come out of that. These are the locations, uh, one through nine, I think, one through seven on this one, that we're looking for, not cracks or anything like that, but we're looking for the displacements and, and so forth that we can uh, calibrate the model. Uh, we're gonna start out with location one. That's right here. And in fact, I believe the crack was adjacent to this flange uh, on location number one. Our only access to it was through the grating. So you're setting up your shot, you need enough light, here's my lighting panels um, uh, down here shooting through and lighting up this flange section. This piping analysis is a little different. I can't get a shot from around the area of this and pick up all the lines and all the directions and it's huge. Uh, just uh, this section of piping uh, that has positions one and two, it's probably 30 feet long. Uh, what you're looking at is three to four stories of uh, vibra uh, pipe that's uh, being utilized here. It's all 10 inch pipe. Uh, here's my setup, at least for the first location. And by the way, the lighting panels, these are the batteries on the lighting panel, which make them infinitely user friendly. This was an area that uh, you can't plug things in. Uh, you'd have to get uh, approval to pull, bring a uh, computer into the area because of spark hazards and explosion. Uh, so there's a lot of limitations on what you can and can't do in these areas. This is shooting through the deck. So the little limitation here is the gradings in the way. The nice thing about it is the grading was moving with the entire coking vessel. So in the wind and in the normal operation of this thing, the tower is going to sway around. And while we're standing there, I can feel the motion in the grating. Okay. What you don't see in this shot is I've excluded those frequencies. So the decking was a very low frequency. The entire structure was moving. I can eliminate those from the, the FFT spectrum and cancel them out. One of the things we have here and we'll talk about coming up is something called a band limited time waveform. And the idea is get the maximum displacements in all of these locations in the X and Y directions and put that into the model. We could do it frequency by frequency in the FFT and say there's five modes or something, but we'd have to root some square all those together and you'll never be assured that the phasing is correct. So either you'll grossly overestimate or grossly underestimate. The band limiting time waveforms, we can band pass a, a series of peaks and get rid of everything else, all the noise in the spectrum and the, the uninteresting stuff out there. And now I can bring that back in, do an inverse FFT, and I have a time waveform just including the four or five peaks that I'm interested in. Okay, And that's what this is. And I'll show you how that works out a little bit uh, down the road here. Um, what you're seeing is some axial vibration along the pipe length, and you see a bit of twisting in there. And I, its jerkiness is because I've slowed it down a little bit to be able to uh, uh, walk through that time waveform a little 
uh, more uniformly. This is that same uh, flange, but from the side. When we're trying to take measurements uh, on anything, you're, you want to define your planar views or your, your orthogonal views. This gives me along the pipe and perpendicular to the pipe as my main axes. The next one gives me uh, vertical to the pipe. That's something we can't see in the other view. And it also gives me another axial uh, along the pipe dimension. So now I can see how much it's really moving in all three directions and put a number on it, which is real important. Why does this look so crummy? Because there's a little stairway. Uh, I was up on a grading platform. This is a stairway down into the building. I was shooting this shot through the stair uh, runs. So that's one stair and another stair. So I can still see the flange. I can still get my information. It just looks, you know, kind of cheesy right there, but that's the only shot I have. Logistics is always a problem. This is uh, another location. This is a T uh, intersection. And again, I'm on the same grading deck. This is probably uh, 10, 12 feet away from uh, where the other measurement was collected. And I'm shooting down through the grading again. There's a little gap in the grading right here. And I get enough of an angle that I can pick it up. And this is what that looks like. So this is some insulation. It's kind of dark. This is that saddle in the pipe right there where the two meet up in the T section. And then this is, uh, they stripped away a lot of the insulation from either side of the, uh, the T there. So now I can see a lot of axial pipe, piping vibration and uh, a lot of uh, axial vibration as well. This is the, uh, the decking that I was standing on or the platform. So I, I had a couple shots where everything was moving. Then you know the camera's moving with the test object. Here, that isn't the case. Here, this is moving independently of the decking so I can assure myself this is real motion. And another shot of me taking a picture down through the gap. Uh, this one I don't have an overall shot of, and I try to get a have somebody pull out their iPhone and take a picture every time so I can uh, put it in some context. This is below the deck. Why does it look so dark? Because life is unfair, and the grating above is where I had my lights, and they were shining down on it. Didn't have any room to get over here and shine directly on it or even go sideways uh, at that location. So I'm left with an oblique angle that I can still see the vertical real well. Um, and I can get a, a rough idea of how much axial is there, but uh, it's a little out of plane, but that's the best we could do. Location number three was coming out of the floor. You can see right here, it's going below deck. I get it about right there where it comes out of the concrete and then it circles around where I can see it. So it's coming back this way. It's all white for some reason. I don't know if it was painted at one time or it's part of the insulation process, but uh, again, 900 degrees. Uh, this is about as close as I wanted to get to it. It's, it got fairly warm in there. Had a couple upgrades to my uh, my camera system, mostly the tripod. Um, I found some tennis balls and cut a slit in them and put them over the feet of my uh, of my tripod, and it worked really well, especially on the um, the grating up above. Uh, I would have had all kinds of problems with the the little ends of this going through that grating. Um, okay, orthogonal shots. We're trying to get a shot vertically. And I'm getting something very close here where I'm going down through the pipe. I want to get something in this direction along the pipe so I can see the X and the Y and out of plane if I can. Okay, so I made my uh, measurement thoughts that way. Thinking of X, Y, and Z, this is the shot from above so I can see horizontally and, and uh, axially along the, along the pipe as it goes through the floor. So I got two of the directions there. This is another um, iPhone shot of the setup. And sorry, it's all washed out there, but uh, had a lot of light on it. This is that view where I'm looking down the length of the pipe. So here I get my, my vertical and my horizontal, and I can uh, 
put all three directions together at this point. Location number four was uh, on a 90 degree bend. And I thought I'd give it, get an overall shot from above um, right on the 90 degree. It gave me a good uh, aesthetically pleasing shot. And this is what we have. So I can see roughly both ends of the pipe. The clamp there on one end helps me discern where I am, but uh, there is some both axial to both pipes is some of the vibration. So we'll have to pull out several things out of that shot. This is one half of that. So I shot down the length of one pipe and then down the length of the other. Now I have a pure XY uh, look at the data. And again, I, it's not crooked or slanted or anything. I'm trying to get the X axis to line up exactly with X and the Y axis with Y. And it gives me the best possible uh, response. So if I put a couple labeled points on here, I should be able to pull off exactly how much vibration in displacement is there. This is uh, the other 90 degree end of this pipe. And again, it was down shooting down the length of it. And there's my clamp and then the insulation package on the other end. So here I can see X and Y pretty directly. Now, I haven't given you any amplitudes yet. I'm going to show you a few things uh, later, but uh, we'll, we'll get into that. This was just basically, here's the shots. Here's what we took data of. Here's how much it was vibrating. This is the end cap of one of the pipes, and uh, it was very hot. It was well protected. We couldn't pull this off. Uh, we did get some of the insulation off, but uh, um, couldn't quite get a, a, a lateral shot that I wanted. This was the end view, so I can see X and Y, and it's bouncing around funny because there's more than one frequency involved, so that's part of this band limited time waveforms. So I want to be able to see how much all those uh, bands or all those natural frequencies are causing motion in the X and the Y direction. And another reason why it's jerky like this is it's not uniform steady state vibration that's driving it. It's not a motor where it's constantly running at 1800 RPM. This is a piece of piping that's being excited and it might have 20 or 30 natural frequencies uh, in there from zero to 500 Hertz, uh, not 500 Hertz, 500 RPM. And uh, you know, all those might have a contribution to the overall motion. So the band limiting helps me pull out uh, the biggest participants and uh, get the app phasing of all those angles as well, so I get a, a really good measurement. Uh, this was a shot of a piece of uh, flange section that had a valve in it. Um, these are flanged together. Uh, this was with the insulation on location number six. So we pulled all that off and shot here, and unfortunately I don't have a, a animation of that. I missed it somewhere. Uh, this is location number seven, and it's at the top of the structure and the piping going down uh, a couple stories till we get to the, the points we had already measured. So this piping was moving. We tried to get a couple shots. I was standing on a balcony, um, a walkway, uh, shooting across. So I got a shot from this direction and a shot from the other direction. And here's the motion. There's a, a couple unique things going on. You look at this, and your eye is drawn, obviously, to the to the vibration, not the overall response, but this down here. This is this protective netting for safety reasons or what have you. Um, the netting's blowing in the wind, which distorts the images behind it. So there isn't all this wild motion there. All we're getting is this kind of global overall vibration a uh, little bit of lateral, a little bit of bounce vertically. And I'm not sure what this bigger line was. It was part of the process, but uh, not one that they were interested in taking data on. So even in the daylight, um, you can never have enough lighting. Uh, I was canceled this job or we put it off because of rain and clouds one day, because uh, even a 
halfway open system, it's really hard to get enough light on uh, piping like this. This is the other oblique direction, roughly, that I, I could get. And this is the animation. I had a little pole blocking my, my shot here, but I could still see the, the motion in the piping. Okay, not a lot of bending and flexing, just uh, overall motion, kind of rigid body type response. And a little distortion here, I wasn't sure what that was. There's something that kind of tag or something that was on this uh, little valve that uh, was moving around. That's what you see all that flutter. Uh, this is another shot. Uh, Location number eight down the length of one of the pipes, 90 degree bend. And here's one direction where you can see the XY plane there, and a second direction on the other side where you can see the XY plane there. Another thing that uh, came up during this, and I, I wondered the time waveform didn't look right, there was a big distortion in it. And right up in here, You'll see it in a couple of seconds there. Somebody turned on a flashlight in the background and was shining it on something. And it showed up in my time waveform data as a huge spike that had nothing to do with the pipe itself. And luckily, you know, we could ignore it. And it was big motion, but it wasn't part of uh, the piping uh, animation. So it didn't, didn't interfere. But I've had that before, people walking in the background behind a shot that I'm taking. Um, and it kind of puzzled me there. I didn't know what that was for a while, but it was a flashlight. Um, this is the, the other coker piping system. There's two drums and they're side by side. So this is a mirror image of uh, the data that I was taking. And I thankfully didn't have to take all the data, but I had to take um, a couple representative shots to say, hey, yes, this side was vibrating as well. So this is uh, one that I can compare to the other end. So I was set up on position number nine, I guess. And this is that piece of pipe that goes into the decking. And while I was making this animation, I'm sure there's enough gap there, but there's a huge amount of uh, gap on the other side. I was kind of surprised that uh, that was that close to the edge of the hole, but it was only moving uh, less than an eighth of an inch peak to peak. So it's not, it is highly amplified. And this pipe wasn't doing too bad. Okay. Um, I want to walk through the wizard because we, we've added a few things and then I'll, I'll take it through uh, some of the animation. In, uh, options that we have now. There is the wizard is redesigned. It has a little bit more information on it that stays put when you go from frame to frame or from step to step. It's still a five-step process. Uh, it gives us our original uh, video MP4 file uh, with a date that comes directly from the camera. Uh, it gives us the ass assigned uh, video dimensions that we choose, uh, 1024 by 1280. Uh, gives us our capture frame rate that we set up, uh, 1,057 uh, feet per second or frames per second. Um, what we're showing is uh, something that hasn't been set yet, number of frames and elapsed time and all that. The distance isn't set. The number of points hasn't really been specified yet. Uh, we select our video, we bring it in, and it is very dark, and it's, I left it dark for a reason, so you can see uh, some of the other brightness and contrast controls. So you, once you look at it a little bit, you can see what I'm talking about, but then, boom, it comes to, comes to life a little bit better uh, with the process, the brightness and contrast controls. Okay, and those are those little sliders here. This is the rotation command, so if you had to turn your camera 90 degrees to get a good shot, this one was set up pretty good for this application. No, I didn't have to turn it. What you're shooting for is lines of, of constant uh, directional value here. So in the X, X direction, in the Y direction, you want it to be lined up with the camera as close as you can possibly be. It's going to give you the best orthogonal view. 
This is the reset crop and crop uh, indicator. So we can we can crop out things. I probably should have got rid of this, but uh, not not that big a deal in this case. Um, you can crop it, and if you don't like it, you can do it again and as many times as you like. If we go to the to the next frame, uh, this is where we set up how many actual frames we want to process. Now you are processing every pixel in here. Okay, every pixel in the display it's 1,024 by 1,280. It's about 1.3 million pixels. Uh, you are also processing actually you're multiplying that by um, how many frames you have. I'm taking data at 1,057 frames per second, which is right here to set it up. So I took eight seconds worth of data. Uh, that would be almost 8,400 uh, frames, individual frames. We can cut that down and make it uh, faster to process. We can cut down the number of uh, the amount of time we take. So instead of taking eight seconds of data, I could take one, or I could go in here with these sliders and set it up. Uh, just to show me one second or two seconds or whatever. Uh, when I'm doing quick jobs, I'll take about a second of data and I'll be able to see what's going on. If it's not pertinent that I have to save that and show the customer, um, then I won't go to the, through the labor of uh, taking more data. But this allows me to do both. I can take my eight seconds worth of data, fill the camera memory, um, but I can only process whatever I want. I can do one second, two seconds, 10 seconds. Well, can't do 10, eight seconds. And that's where this is set up. So if I'm not explaining that too well, um, you'll see on the next slide. So right now it's set up for 0.472 seconds. So I'm only capturing 500 frames and that's this spacing out of the eight seconds. So that, it might work. Uh, usually I like get so many frames per second to actually get at least one second or two seconds, any multiple of that. This is when I move that slider over and I get out to 8470, um, I have eight seconds worth of data. Now taking it is not a problem. I just fill the camera. It takes a, an extra 10 seconds to override it and we're ready to go. Processing it might take a little bit longer. Okay, one second's worth of data is uh, very fast. Uh, eight seconds might take you a little while. Go get a cup of coffee and come back. Um, this is a set distance command. And what we're trying to do is provide a reference on the, on the, draw, not on the drawing on the, um, the image of an actual dimension. This was a 10 inch pipe and actually this was reset to 10.75 because the outer diameter is bigger than uh, the standard uh, sizing convention. Uh, so you press the set distance button, you draw a point from across the pipe. So there's my 10.75 inches and I put that number in here and tell it's inches and say next and we're good. Okay, if I don't like my uh, dimension and I mess it up, I go back and do it again. So. It'll, it's pretty forgiving. This is the point density. This is how much resolution I want in the uh, final videos that are put out. And this is a pretty, uh, pretty high resolution here. I can make it uh, much higher, but 6,800 or so uh, points, I get an XY uh, time waveform for each one of those points. So it's, it's a lot of data, okay? Um, but you need that, you need to pull it out sometimes. If you're on edges and you're, you're trying to discern one structure from another, it's, it's very, uh, very beneficial to have a high number of points. Again, that'll increase the time it takes to calculate all that. Um, and if you had eight seconds worth of data and um, high resolution, this is over a billion calculations that it has to do. So it taxes your computer a little bit, but um, you can always uh, process less data. I'm just uh, a little bit of a purist. I like doing it the hard way. This is where you can uh, get rid of some of those frames and some of the points in those frames to, to uh, uh, make your 
fidelity a little better on the actual piece of moving hardware and get rid of background noise and, and different things that show up. So if I move these sliders in, this is a histogram of uh, the average response or the displacement. So out here, there's a, a like three sigma points where there's really no motion out here. So you can slide this one up this direction and get rid of that background noise that isn't moving. So most of my background's black uh, just because the, the way it's lit um, and a lot of that will just fall off. This end might be something that is actually moving that uh, there's a low, there are very few, but um, they might interfere. So we can, we can adjust the video in both directions and make something a little bit better. So they remove the shininess. This is part of the grading that was in there. And if I pulled it in a little bit further, some of the other grading would come off, but a lot of that grading is right around where I want to see things. So you get, there's a trade-off. And even if you do it and, and process it and you don't like it, you can go back and refilter this. So it's a, it's a win-win. So that's what we're working on here. Um, I want to walk you through a few steps, and this is with one of the flange setups that um, we were using on position number one. This was the, the one that had the crack in the, in the piping wall. Um, so did a little extra um, setup to see the different um, analysis uh, parameters that we can set up. Um, coking is a refining unit operation that upgrades material called bottoms from the atmospheric or vacuum distillation pro process into a higher value products. Uh, as the name implies, it's petroleum coke and it's basically pure coal. They've removed all the dirt, they've removed all the uh, other molecules that are in there and you're left with something that you can't break down anymore. It's pure carbon. Um, here's my um, e-drum in my directional uh, measurement that we're gonna take, uh, position number one. Here's my uh, setup, um, position the camera, the lights, make sure I'm, I'm lit up well. This is the time waveform ODS. This is the raw data. So I've zoomed in on it a little bit so that you can see there is motion in there, but uh, it looks like noise if you look at the broadband, all eight seconds of this. But there is a little wave to it, and that's what we're seeing here. So there's a benefit in, uh, in processing this data and looking at it in the time domain. Uh, it is the maximum amount of uh, displacement. So here at the peak is about uh, 50 mils and the negative peak is about 50 mils. So you get about a 10th of an inch uh, of vibration, which is fairly significant. Uh, maybe not for piping, but for uh, uh, some other processes. Okay, and remember we are in displacement. You know, you can integrate this and differentiate it and go to, to uh, velocity or acceleration if you wish. This is uh, animation in the frequency domain. So it's a, a FFT ODS animation. Uh, just like uh, anything you wanna animate, you put your cursor on that peak and it will generate the uh, appropriate vibration for that mode. Um, and you see here, I've slowed this down too much. Uh, I think, I thought I changed it, but maybe I didn't. This is at 187 uh, CPM. You can see a little bit of a twist, uh, not much axial response. There's two peaks right here. The other peak uh, provides that axial response. So there's a couple different modes that are very close together. Uh, we can bring this alive a little bit by going to the color contour. And now you can readily see the, the rotational effect. And it gives me a scale. So my I'm just orange. So I have about uh, 17 to 20 mils peak. And if I turn this into peak to peak motion, I have about 35 uh, mils of vibration. This is the band limited uh, time waveform ODS. So you can do band limited um, uh, frequency based ODS, but the, uh, the thought process here is I want to 
put my cursor around peaks that are causing the dominant amount of vibration. And there's a couple peaks in here, as we just noted. So instead of a peak, uh, peak cursor, I put a band cursor on it. Then I put it through uh, a transformation. Uh, it filters, uh, it's bandpass filtering the data and everything that isn't in this bandpass region will go away. Now I can do an inverse FFT of what's left and I get a more pure sine wave. And it's going to have the combination of those two peaks that are in here in its amplitude. So how they interact with each other, how they're phased together, I might not be able to put that together correctly. This will do it for me. So it should give me the properly phased uh, time waveform for that, uh, for that location and that frequency. So now you can see I have, uh, I don't know what the amplitude is here. Um, let's call it uh, 0.05 in the positive direction and roughly 0.05 in the negative direction, or excuse me. Yeah, let's, yeah, I think that's about right. Anyway, um, it helps you understand uh, the motion a little bit better, at least the peak of the motion. Um, and that's called band limited ODS. Uh, they do have a, a feature that allows labels to be applied either in the uh, FFT frequency domain or uh, time domain. And these labels are very helpful in detecting X and Y motion. So X is uh, horizontal here on the page. Uh, X is the top measurement. So I have nine thousandths of vibration out there. I have nine thousandths here. I have 14 thousandths on this side. And uh, about five thousandths here. So that total uh, measurement is peak. If we do it in peak to peak, we just double what that level is and we'll have uh, the motion indicated by the video. And lastly, we have uh, a live orbit that you can set up. So I picked four different locations, uh, one on each flange and two on the piping back here. And you can see the Directional motion kind of shows up. It's a little out of plane, but it's mostly horizontal. Um, and it gives you an indication of the vibration. So we can still get the, the amplitude and phase from the, um, from the labels and get a real number. Here it's just telling us if there's any, anything out of phase across the joint where you might have a loose bolt or, or something fractured or what have you. Um, finally, uh, we have a little bit of training news and a little bit of, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, software uh, pricing news. So this is the VT450, which is ODS videos, uh, starting from scratch. So what it entails is you get a uh, the VT420, which is ODS Pro software. You get the video processing, and then you pick your camera package. And there's two different camera package. Uh, one high-speed camera is a Kronos 1.4, and they've just recently come out with a Kronos 2.1. Uh, if you have your own camera, that's fine. I believe it'll still work with your with your own camera. There might be a little thing or two you have to know, but uh, it should it should work with that. If you have a basic ODS already, if you own the Vibrant software and you just have basic. ODS, you can upgrade that package. Um, it gives you the right signal processing and then the video processing like above, and it basically turns it into ODS Pro. So now you have, uh, um, you turned your system into a, a video package. Uh, you still have to pick a camera as well. Uh, and those two cameras are priced down below. And this is an, the accessory kit that comes with it. So you get lights, you get tripods, you get a carrying case um, and so forth. And this is one of the Kronos cameras. Uh, in the training section, uh, um, we will come to your plant. We can come to you and uh, pricing's uh, per person. And we'll give you camera basics, show you how one of those cameras, the 1.4 or 2.1 work. We're gonna do some ODS software overview, lighting setup tips, capture data capture best processes, um, 
and then we're going to go through the wizard we're going to make videos and the key to this if if i can do this in an office building but i don't have equipment to actually take the data and process it okay uh, there's not a lot of heavy duty equipment in in the office area in your plant we can go find the machine that's been giving you all kinds of problems and we can set this up and go through it and learn how it's done on your equipment and hopefully solve a problem um, so there's lots of uh, ME scope wizards there's a lot of hotkeys that uh, we haven't talked about too much in this class but that's the process that allows us to do quick steps through the software um, and we can manipulate the data in a lot of different ways that you might not know of and finally we can do modal analysis with this. Uh, if you were at my um, webinar a couple times ago, we did some uh, modal analysis on wind turbine towers. So it is, it's an operating deflection shape or a modal analysis tool. And we can get spectrum, waveform, we can process it. It's heavy duty processing in the MESCOPE uh, software. And we can do all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, that's about all I have for today. Uh, I hope I haven't. We got some questions. You there, Dan? Oh yeah. Oh okay. yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> we got a handful of questions that came in. I thought you were going to uh, answer them all. Oh well, I can I can I can answer a few of these. Um, we'll start off with uh, one. Uh, here we've got a few more popping in here. Um, first one is uh, from Ramiro Leon. Is the equipment used, camera and lighting, intrinsically safe? um the camera is a computer and it's it's open on the sides and there's cooling involved so there's a there's potentially a spark issue um when i was at the refinery they didn't seem to care about that at all they said this camera's a camera so i don't think there's anything in there that would actually spark unless it, it malfunctioned you drop something into the camera or what have you but yeah, it is all battery. It's all running on yeah. batteries. So. Yeah, it's all battery, and same thing with the lighting. Um, I would never do this job. I just well, I, they wouldn't let me if I had to pull extension cords through there and right. uh, do it with AC power. But the DC power is the way to go. And, and along those lines, um, with the camera, there's a couple different ways um, to actually activate it. You can utilize audio, so you could say, um, you know start video stop video so you don't have to actually uh depress anything so there is different ways to trigger there's there's an electronic way to trigger it there's the audio way of triggering it uh and then you can also trigger the camera based on motion so there are ways to completely remove yourself so you're not actually having to use some sort of external force or you know something that might electrically send a signal right um so uh next question from mary and i think i can help answer this one uh Peak to peak with velocity. The last I heard from President Mark was zero to peak. Can we get this confirmed exactly, please? Um, Marion, I do have an answer for you. The data block uh, display is defaulted to peak to peak. And so that um, is where that is now. Dan, did you want to add anything onto that? Well, it, it is and it isn't. In, in, uh, <laughs> if you're looking in the time waveform, it's peak to peak. That's the convention, especially with uh, displacement data. Um, when you're, because you, you normally will look at an acceleration time waveform uh, when you're monitoring machinery, or if you're in a um, fluid film variance with uh, prox probes, you'll be measuring displacement peak to peak because you want that full range of motion. You need to know what it is. Um, when you're uh, capturing data on um, trending machinery uh, in a plant, you're going to integrate the signal and go to velocity because velocity is a better um, trending parameter and that velocity setup would be zero to peak so i'll have to talk to mark and see what he what he's <laughs> yeah, behind that but right right yeah for now the default display in the data data block is peak to peak um all right, next question from Marion. Uh, looking at the entire frame moving, why is that now? Why is the cam why is that now the camera moving? I think he's asking, is the camera moving with that frame? I think this is one you're going back to one of the slides you had when I was looking through the floor. Um, yeah, this guy. Looking at it, looking at entire frame moving. Why is that now the camera moving? So I think yeah, that one. 
Well, there's a little bit of, yeah, you, you can't get rid of it all, especially uh -huh. you can see right here, there's, it's in and out of focus. And if your camera's not, you know, it'll pick this out really well because it's all focused yeah. in, but, but it's, it's looking at something in the foreground. It can't really concentrate on what it is. But there are, there is a, a some frequency component in here that is move, making the deck move. Um, I tried to minimize it as much as possible, but that was about as good as I could get. Okay, next question from Javier. How many persons and how much time did it take for the, all the measurements of this piping system? Um, just me. I had, uh, it took about a day, almost a full day. And uh, I had two guys helping me um, taking uh, setup pictures and things like that. But basically, it's once you have a process down, and I, it, I don't know how I can say that because every every job is a different process. You're you're kind of making it up as you go on. But if you decide ahead of time, I want an X direction, a Y direction, a Z direction on anything I take, and make sure it's you know in line with those axes. Uh, you might not get it, but it will uh, help you focus on, I need to do this many measurements. And, you know, the, taking the data is not that hard once it's set up. You just trigger the camera on and off at whatever interval you're interested in. But, uh, it, yeah, it took a whole day. I think I took, uh, there was like 12 locations, and I took maybe, if you estimate, two. So I took about 25 to 30 images. Okay, uh, next question from Javier. Uh, regarding training, could we take a virtual training course? Yeah, obviously, um, you know, with the COVID and so forth, I'm sure that that's kind of uh, what he's referring yeah, to I've, rather than doing in person. Yeah, I've been thinking about that and I I probably would be ready to do that in about a month. I need a little time to put it together, but I was hoping this stuff would blow over by now, but it really hasn't. Fully done that. I think it's blowing. It's, it, the plan blowing is in, in the works. <laughs> yeah, blowing in. The plan's in the works to have a, a webinar based uh, training class. Yes. Uh, Robert's asking, looks like a fairly mature product. How long has this been around? Robert, the Emmy Scope's been around for over 25 years. So that part is very mature. Odious Videos, uh, this product was launched uh, last November is when this product um, was officially launched. It had been in development for you know, a number of months prior to that. Um, but that uh, give you an idea on, on the whole thing. But Emmyscope has certainly been around for a long time and, and perhaps you're aware of that. Uh, Ramiro asks, is the software upgrade applicable to any version of the Emmyscope software? Um, if you have uh, VT620, which is the basic ODS, uh, you can upgrade from there. You do need to get up to ODS Pro, uh, which you're seeing here on the screen now. So uh, if you currently have ODS Pro, you do not need to, the, the upgrade package here, the 9,000, um, you can actually purchase just the, nine, the VES 9,000. Which uh, is 6,000. Which is $6,000, correct. Um, so the bare minimum you need to have is an ODS Pro, uh, it, it, so you can get up to that with uh, using this uh, VT450 package. Uh, let me see here. Uh, we've got a few more questions. This is great. I love these questions. Are there any plans to adapt this to a drone application? Bob, you are right the on the money. <laughs> We are actually going to be doing some testing on a drone here within probably a month or so. We actually have a drone on order and we are looking to move into that. Um, so stay tuned as we start to move into that area. But this is a perfect application for that because as you can imagine, um, I could set a route for a drone to run around a plant, take uh, measurements remotely or, or via the drone and then come back and upload the, that data. So that is something that we are moving into. So we'll be uh, 
given more information on that here in the in the upcoming months. Well, um, yeah, based on uh, what Mark Senior was telling me, uh, that the the drones that they have or you're going to get now uh, will move around objects. You you could just tell them coordinates of where to go, and it will find a way to get there, even if it's blocked everywhere. It it'll get itself back on course. So it's it's really great technology, and there's appears to be a lot of applications for it. Uh, Bob's got a question. What is the f max for the cameras? Uh, depends on the resolution that you set and the frame rate. Um, the, I always get the maximum resolution of the camera, which is that 1280 by 1040 uh, number, but the frame rate is whatever you want it to be. So your actual um, F max is going to be half the frame rate. I, I would go with the 1057, so my um, my F max is 528 hertz. Yeah, the and that'd, camera be, that'd will... be the highest. Mm -hmm. You can get, yeah, I mean, if you go way down in resolution, you can get way up there, you know, much higher, uh, but the, the other resolution drops off quite a bit. Um, we do have, uh, Arthur, on our website, you can take a look at the Kronos data sheet, and it gives you all the different um, uh, FMAX and so forth, resolution, record time, and so forth. Um, but you can take a look at the data sheet on our website if you want to get some more information. Incidentally, it's important to note that you do not have to use the cameras that we recommend. If you have a camera from, a, from somebody else, uh, you very well could, and you can get an MP4 out of it, you can certainly utilize your existing high-speed cameras. Um, so I just want to make that note to, to everybody. Um, you, the, these are cameras that we recommend, and they've been wonderful, and, and they've, they're a very good price point. Chronos cameras, but there are a number of different high-speed cameras out there that you can uh, take a look at or you can utilize with Emiscope. Uh, let's see, a couple questions here, follow-up. Uh, Ramiro Leon, will you show this presentation as a downloadable file? Certainly, we can do that. Um, Christopher asks, could you, re could you record data on a conveyor in a large structure 200 feet away? Yeah. Uh, I did a I did a wind turbine. And those yeah, blades at the top are uh, you know a couple hundred feet away easily. That's yeah, right. The camera has a nice zoom capability. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you have plenty of lighting uh, for what you're looking for, like inside a coal plant, inside the uh, conveyor, you might not be able to do it. But outside, you could look at it and see if you can see the rollers. Uh, you should be able to pick out the bad ones. Yeah, I think really the limitation there is is how much you can zoom with the lens, and then your lighting, of course, is going to be an issue. So, okay, that's it for questions now. Like I said, we did record this, uh, so you'll be getting a, a copy of the recording, and uh, I can certainly share a downloadable file if you're uh, interested. I can send that to you, Ramiro. Um, if you have any additional questions, feel free to email us. You can email Dan directly at modalguy at AOL.com, uh, or you can send it to us here at Vibrant at sales at vibetech.com, uh, and we can get the additional questions answered for you. If you got any pricing questions, training questions, or questions specific to the webinar, uh, we'd be happy to get those answered for you.